All right. Praise of folly. Welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really glad to to talk with you. Uh, just to provide a little bit of background on my end. Uh, I, I've heard you around in these circles for a while, but I hadn't heard you speak on Tolkien until you were on uh, Morgcast with Morgoth's Review. And that was really an excellent episode talking about Tolkien, talking about the new Amazon show. And so I really wanted to pick your brain and have you know, some type of a productive conversation, both about Tolkien as a man, and then also hopefully later we can kind of transition into the uh, the Amazon series. Sure. So if you could, just at like a hundred foot level, could you introduce Tolkien and his work just in very broad strokes? Sure. So Tolkien uh, was born in 18, January 3rd, 1892, and lived till the 2nd of September, 1973, he was born in South Africa and died in Hampshire, England. He's primarily known for, of course, his, his uh, fantasy work, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. But broadly speaking, what Tolkien is a part of is this sort of like post-World War I English literary circle, which included people like C.S. Lewis uh, and Chesterton and others. But more specifically, there was a group called the Inklings, where they would work together to tell their stories to each other. So Tolkien... And Lewis and some and these others were like, well, who's going to write the stories that we want to read? And they said, well, we're going to have to do it because no one else will write them. Uh, Lewis, like Tolkien, Tolkien like Lewis were both medieval literary scholars. Uh, Lewis tended to be more Renaissance, late medieval, whereas Tolkien was more early medieval. He wrote The Monster and His Critics about Beowulf. And he liked a lot of the uh, Icelandic, Norse, and Finnish sagas. So... His basic idea in literature was to create a broad critique of modernity and technology. So we see throughout the Lord of the Rings, whether it's Sauron or Saruman, or the scouring of the Shire, the, the dangers of technology and sort of externalizing responsibility to other to, to other people and to saying that, well, look, like what Saruman says to Gandalf, it's like, well, you know. We're gonna we're gonna ally with Sauron, and nothing's really changed. You know, the ends justify the means. And Tolkien is saying, no, hard no here. This is not what's going on here. There's also this overlay of the sort of futility of life. There's this concept he calls doom, which he gets from the sort of pagan Norse, which is an idea that there's a sort of fatedness that you have as an individual in life. So each of the heroes throughout the legendarium have their own dooms it's not unique to that it's not necessarily shared between others it might be it might be unique to them and part of the heroism is to just stand up to that and to you know uh, rise to the occasion and accept one's fate and so, so with well, you go ahead sir no so it's interesting that i i, I remember as a as a it's probably nine or ten the first time i made it through the lord of the rings and it's odd that you bring up that concept of doom, because even at a time where I had obviously no capability to be making any type of literary criticism, right? I was in grade school. But I remember the feeling of just deep, like sadness and disquiet. Then even at the end, you know, the end when, you know, everything is kind of being put to right. Well, the elves leave and they never come back, you know, because that is that. And obviously that's on a, that's a more of like a civilizational level. Right. But I do remember that being kind of the first time I was exposed to something like that, where it's like, this is kind of the the end of something good, you know, even kind of wrapped up. And obviously that's not exactly what you were referencing, but that's kind of what popped into my mind. Right. Yeah. And one of the aspects about the entire legendarium, so this would include the Silmarillion and various unpublished works, is a, one of the, I think the most important themes of Tolkien's work is that evil leaves scars. So at the end of the Silmarillion, Morgoth is destroyed, but, you know, Balrog survives, Sauron survives, other evil creatures survive, the spiders who were the spawn of Ungoliant. But more to the point, the the stain is, it, it persists through men who then, you know, eventually some men will ally with Sauron and the environment itself. So more, more Middle Earth itself is corrupted and polluted. And even in his defeat, there's still scars. And we see the same theme with the Lord of the Rings in the return of the King when Sauron is defeated and in the scouring of the Shire, you know, Saruman was hoping to destroy the Shire in perpetuity so that nobody could see the blooming Shire again, but with Galadriel's gift of the soil, 
Sam was able to speed that process up. But evil leaves. So even when you fight evil and win, it's not like you can ever. It's not like you can go back to before evil tainted something. It still leaves scars. Well, and I don't want to spoil the entire kind of thesis of my notes here, but that was that was kind of the point I wanted to to drive towards over the course of this interview, is that to me at least it seems like you have to have in order to have any work of compelling fiction both a powerful understanding of heroism and the good and also one of evil and so i think that a lot of modern fiction is kind of trash essentially because it doesn't understand evil right like evil is essentially something that you know you blow up the death star and everything's fine right and evil in tolkien is much more realistically rendered and not realistic in the sense that it's like nasty or brutish you know like a serial like some kind of cheap true crime but I mean, realistic in the sense that in our own lives, we know the fact that even when you be evil, right, there are casualties to that, you know, and it's not casualties like, oh, you know, the, the red shirts got blasted away, right? Like it's, it's real things like, you know, the destruction of culture that just, and even on like a personal level, right? Like we know that sin is damaging. So anyway, carry on. I, I don't want to step on your toes. No. Yeah. And, and also the idea that evil destroys and can't create so one of the things that marks tolkien's legendarium is it's a very well thought out philosophical framework which is broadly rooted in a sort of uh, western philosophical tradition uh, we see a lot of so the idea that evil is the negation of the good and can only destroy we see that in augustine we see that you know these these very orderly structured worlds sort of indebted to aristotle and thomas aquinas uh, the one ex the one sort of fuzzy part are the dragons. It's not clear that Morgoth, at least in the explicit written material, corrupted them from anything. And in fact, they were more powerful than almost anybody from the, the Valar, except well, except the Valar themselves. So that's that's one that's one aspect that hasn't quite been organized out in Tolkien's work. But broadly, evil is a corruption. So orcs are corruptions of elves. Trolls are corruptions of ants. Uh, the fact that the the dragons don't necessarily neatly fit in there might be the result that by the end of his life, Tolkien had admitted he had tried to write a holistic, epic fantasy foundation for the English people, but failed. And it, it seems from what I've read, he he basically believed that it failed because he he was not able to generate the support that he wanted or needed to continue the project because basically it just became depressing to continue the project when no one was invested in it and he was doing it all alone against all odds as he was getting you know much older so but that's sort of a sketch of the sort of broad themes of the legendarium the other thing that that tolkien brings to the table is that he was by profession a philologist which is someone who studies languages so oral oral traditions written traditions and then tries to determine from from that the, the meanings of words and how they you change over time and imbue things with value. And so in his, he himself wrote fictional languages, the, the Dwarven language, the Elvish language with sub languages, the black speech of Mordor, but real world languages that inspired Tolkien were Celtic, um, old, you know, medieval English, like Beowulf style English, Finnish, Germanic languages and, and Welsh. And so, for example, we see, in the Rohirrim, the idea of a sort of Anglo-Saxon and linguistic lineage. So Aon means Ao means horse, so horse joy. And Aomer means war horse or famous, so famous war horse. And Isengard is a German, which means stone city. And so these these words are chosen because they mean something important. And Tolkien uh, when he's using, you know, a, a sort of what he calls common speech, which is essentially English or some derivation of English with some German admixture. But certainly when you get to Elvish and Dwarvish and the black speech languages he wrote on his own, they all have specific meanings. And to be honest, this is one of the things I think where Tolkien overlaps a little bit with Earthsea, because the, the other fantasy genre, Earthsea, is the idea that magic is learning the true name of something. And if you can learn someone or something's true name, you can control it because you're defining it or at least describing it 
accurately. Now, obviously, that kind of control is not imbued by the knowledge of language in Middle Earth, but it shows that language is important for describing the true nature of what a thing is. And so what we do see with the these these early fantasies is the importance of language and the study of language for how they develop over time. It's it's odd that you not odd. It's interesting that you bring up that connection to to Earthsea because really that it's another book that I read at kind of a roughly similar time. And it, it reminds me enough of kind of the way Orwell describes language manipulation, right? Like 1984 is a it's a good enough book, but I think it's comparisons to it are starting to get a little bit long in the tooth. But to me, the part I find the most interesting is that is that last third of the book, right? Where essentially they're the the the, the party is breaking down our main character and kind of reforming him. And, and so much of that is done through essentially language control, right? And and that language essentially forms the framework through which you understand reality, right? That essentially like humans kind of need language to come up with complicated concepts. And so the kind of rules of language form the rules you kind of impose on reality. And so there's both a there's both a noble and kind of a disturbing takeaway from that, right? The noble take is like, all right, kind of like, well, okay, like, you know, creating languages and stuff like that. That kind of gives you a, like a, like a, I guess like a different way of looking at reality, which is valuable. But on the other end, you get this kind of like weird dystopian language control, right? Where we can make the problem going away, go away by essentially making it either impossible to express, you know, or unable to be described, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, exactly. The other thing that we see is that the na- the way naming conventions work is so in this in this in an analogous way in the the book of Genesis when uh, God changes Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah, which signifies a change in their state of existence, we see that names change as well. Saruman goes from Saruman the White to the Saruman of the coat of many colors, who indicates a change of perspective. Gandalf goes from Gandalf the Great to Gandalf the White. Get Aragorn is known by many different names depending on the context in which he's in. And he eventually changes his name once he becomes king of Gondor. And so what it's important is the changing of names represents a change either in character or station or position. So with, Gan- with Saruman, we see the idea of Saruman of many colors, which is the idea that Gandalf says to him, he who destroys a thing to understand a thing is parted from the path of wisdom. And so this marks the fact that Saruman has become a fool because he's gone from white to many colors. But he justifies it as saying that white is the canvas on which one paints. Gandalf then goes from gray to white because he's ascended to a higher level. And so naming conventions not only are important at the beginning and when something is made, but they're also important as something changes. That's interesting because when you when you brought up Genesis, it reminds me of kind of the, the easiest example at hand, which is right. How how does how does God charge Adam with essentially putting himself in dominion over the animals? Well, he tells them to name them, you know, and that is that kind of like deep idea about going back to Earthsea, right? Like names granting you control over it, you know. That like once it's named, it can be you know either literally controlled in that case, or kind of discussed and wrestled with, you know. And the other example it reminds me of is right, like when Israel is given his name, you know, essentially like that is again, like kind of one of those moments in which essentially that a, a changing of names signifies kind of a changing of character, right? Instead of going from kind of the, like the runt of the litter second son to kind of the, the great father of a nation, right? Through the changing of a name. So yeah, I'm curious. Oh, sorry. Carry on. Well, no, go ahead. So, and if we have more to talk on this topic, I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off. So go ahead. Oh, no, I I was just going to say that what's – so the other thing, I guess, as as a segue, what these naming conventions represent is fidelity to European traditions, right? So the the Norse, Germanic, Finnish, Celtic traditions. I think we can see that through through the language, you know, of common speech, but also through, like, um, Elvish and and others – that there, that Tolkien is is implicitly and explicitly drawing inspiration from them because though the meanings those words have in Middle Earth 
or in some sense derived philologically from the meanings they had in the sagas and the epics and the oral traditions of, of those people. Well, the other thing we see too, though, is the Jewish Christian concept. So the idea of, you know, names change, signifying a change in station from like Genesis, you know, we see that. We see the idea of power corrupting. So the idea that, you know, power for its own sake or knowledge for its own sake at the expense of anything else is bad, right? So on the Norse mythology, Odin seeks knowledge at all costs, you know, even to all sorts of self-maiming and whatnot. But that's considered a good thing for the Vikings, right? But where Saruman looks too deeply into the knowledge and it's bad and it corrupts him and he serves Sauron. That's more of a, a, a biblical view derived from the Bible, where if you look too deeply into, you know, Satan's doctrines, it might tempt you away from the faith. And so we see in a more subtle way, Jewish Christian concepts. Another one that's most obvious to mind is in the Silmarillion when Alpharazan, the last king of Numenor, goes to Valinor, his punishment is to be devoured by the earth alive, which is one of the punishments in the book of Numbers to what happened to a group of men that opposed Moses. So that's a little more subtle. Um, the dwarves, Tolkien admits, are inspired by the Jews. Moria uh, is spelled almost identical to the Hebrew mountain Moriah, with the only exception of the H being removed. And so we see all, all of these different elements cohering together. So, for example, uh, fun fact, Rohan uh, is, is, is considered a sort of alt-history experiment, sort of. So Tolkien thought that the Battle of Hastings was a disaster for England, that the Normans shouldn't have won that the Anglo-Saxons you know, were, the, were the true representation of the English spirit, so to speak, he's a, he's a Spenglerian term, and that if only they had knights of their own, they could have defeated William's knights. And so the Rohirrim are sort of Tolkien's what if, what if the Saxons had their own knightly caste that was able to maintain their independence and freedom. Gondor seems to be broadly based off of Rome and Byzantium, and a lot of a lot of like the free folk, like say the the woodsmen, the Beorings, the hobbits, seem to be more like rural English. What's well, interesting because I, I I did want to kind of discuss that, and and I agree. Obviously, you're more knowledgeable than I am, but it's very clear that kind of the fingerprints of you know Western culture more broadly, but it's the Christian tradition explicitly are all over Tolkien's work. So one of my my great mentors is a is a really wise woman, and she 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 said once that Lord of the Rings was essentially the most Christian thing she'd ever read outside of the Bible, right? And it's it's odd that you bring that up because I, I had obviously I had no specific knowledge of you know things like you know being condemned to be eaten alive by the by the earth, but it's odd because it is both kind of speaking the language of pre-Christian Europe, you know, in some cases kind of explicitly, right? Like going back to, I guess the Anglo-Saxons were Christianized, you know, but the kind of, at least the version we see of them is not. But it's odd because explicitly there's almost no, at least in my reading, and maybe I'm wrong, right? But there's very little explicit religion in Lord of the Rings, but it's still very, and again, I, I'm forced to use kind of nebulous words, but it's still very powerfully there, right? So do you think you could kind of explore that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So the the only actual organized religion anywhere in the legendarium is the false religion dedicated to Morgoth that Sauron brought to Numenor in the Akalabeth. And that's what's really interesting. So is, is Lord of the Rings a Christian work? Now, I know there are people that try to say that, and as much as I would like to say that, I think a better way to put it is Middle Earth and the legendarium are perennial works because for example the fundamental i think non-christian element in lord of the rings is the idea that death is a gift and we see this in the silmarillion where the men wish immortality of the, of the elves but of course the elves in middle earth who are immortal uh wish they could die because or at least wish they could leave because they don't fit into middle earth anymore so the issue is from a christian point of view and even, you know, by extension, a, a traditional Jewish point of view, death is a curse. And so it's it's a little difficult to square that with the idea that death is a gift. Death, so some of the church fathers view death as a gift, but only after the fall, because, you know, an immortal 
human who could indulge in sin and vice his whole life it would lead to a life of misery and suffering. But it's only a qualified gift after man had already chosen rebellion. Whereas if you read Tolkien, it's not clear at all that men chose to rebel against uh, Uru or Luvatar in some sort of primordial sense like Adam. Uh, that's not what happened. Not not in even you know not in the unpublished works that Christopher Tolkien later brought to light. So I think that's a problem. Now some people say it's a Catholic work. Now you could point to like the Lumbus bread being having this rejuvenating power, like the host. You could say that Elbereth is like the Virgin Mary. I mean, she's not actually a virgin; she's married to Mandos, but she she does have that like Mary uh, invocation element to it. But there's an organized priesthood. Which, if this was supposed to be a Catholic work, like say Canticle for Leibowitz, you'd expect to see a organized priesthood. Um, that's not there. Now, there's certainly themes from all over the Western tradition: pagan, Christian, uh, Jewish. The Tolkien says the dwarves were inspired by the Jews in his 173rd letter. So, basically, there's a lot of Western themes that are being woven together to create this tapestry of a what was once started out as sort of the the true English myth sort of has grown as as he wrote it and as he added to it into this more of an homage or collage of all these Western concepts. And so I think that the best way to put it is it's perennial. So yeah, it does have Christian themes. It does have, you know, Norse themes, Celtic themes, Homeric themes. But I think it's it's too difficult to say that it's just one of those or the other. That's well said. And I think that, that that was kind of pointing at the the tension I was I was identifying, right? Even inexpertly. So one of the things I want to talk about and kind of shift to is do you think you could run down, I guess, kind of the history of how I guess like Tolkien's intellectual property was handled? Because I think for a lot of people my age, their first exposure was the movies. Right? Like those came out a little bit young for me. I would have you know, I would have been very young when they came out, but all the same, like they were very much in the culture when I kind of came enough, came to age to be able to watch them. And obviously there's stuff before that and stuff after that. So do you think you could kind of run down the history of, you know, the Lord of the Rings franchise, if we want to use that term? Sure. So one of the things that we see uh, in the earliest form is radio dramatizations. So the first one was, in, I think, 1956. Tolkien was, he was still alive at the time. He wasn't terribly pleased with it, but it was made nonetheless. The BBC uh, did a 1981 radio version. So this is under Christopher Tolkien. And that was considered to be broadly a success for the, the Christopher Tolkien himself has, has given assent that it was a fairly accurate and faithful representation of it. There was in the 1970s by Rankin Bass, the cartoon Hobbit, the cartoon Return of the King. I grew up with those two. There was a Bash Guys, the Lord of the Rings. I think that was also around the same time in the 70s. And these are all rather niche products that didn't really get a lot of attention. And then, of course, we have the Peter Jackson films, which a lot of people have problems with. I mean, Christopher Tolkien himself thought that Peter Jackson took A, too many liberties, B, commercialize the IP. Well, I mean, he's a movie director. I mean, I think you should have already assumed he was going to commercialize the IP once you gave him the rights to it. But um, for a long time, Christopher Tolkien was very strict. It, who got rights to the IP? Obviously, BBC did. Obviously, Peter Jackson did. And by extension, New Line Cinema, which created the, the, the fund of the films and produced film-related video games. But otherwise, he was very strict at who got it. Now, he he's since passed away. And now there doesn't seem to be anybody at the helm of the Tolkien estate. And, and this is something that just baffles me, right? How is it that a guy for, for 40, 50 years could be so dedicated to preserving the integrity of the IP, just not have a plan B when he dies? And just let Amazon get their mitts all over it. Well, well right. And I feel like it's almost, and obviously, like, I, I think in all likelihood, Christopher Tolkien was a very good man. You know, so I'm not trying to make this into a personal attack on him. But but in an odd way, it feels almost kind of emblematic of a of a wider trend, right? That there were all of these you know, kind of pre-existing institutions, 
that essentially we're at one time the the ne the necessary maintenance of selecting the next generation just went unfilled, right? And so we see things like even you know relatively si like silly things like the Rotary Club or the Lions or things like that. Like there was no attempt to make the next generation of members of you know stakeholders, and so essentially we see this like just widespread graying of institutions, right? And in many cases, they just kind of slowly peter out. In this case, because the institution was one man, right? Like once he was gone, it just kind of fell to, you know, just the the powers that be, right? And so I think the other thing that's, I guess, personally distressing to me is that, and this is kind of what we were talking about before we went live, right? That there has been this broad trend of essentially revitalizing and cheapening and ruining, you know, kind of older properties, but kind of the advantage, and maybe this is just, you know, me getting emotional about it, which I, I'm fine to say, you know, but to a certain extent, this feels more sacred, right? This feels more, I guess, wrong to cheapen, right? Like Star Wars was kind of always commercial, you know, even when it was in the good old days back in the eighties, right? Every kid had a Star Wars lunchbox, you know? So it's less of a, and again, I don't want to say serious, but I guess it was less of a serious form of art or expression. Yeah, part of this is the the drive to make profits in capitalism. And oftentimes it's more profitable to cannibalize something that's already there than to try to try something new, right? <laughs> there was this there was this quote that George Lucas always gets in trouble for, but I actually think he's right. He said that in the it was easier to make a film in the Soviet Union because you didn't have to worry about making money. And he said from people that he talked to, you actually had less political correctness to deal with when it came to topics you had to include in the film. And I'm like, you know, you know what? Maybe you're right. I mean, if the Soviet Union, say, 1990 had done a Lord of the Rings film, it would have been a lot more accurate than anything Amazon's going to cook up. You know, I mean, so, so well, it that. reminds me of that. And look, Moldbug has his criticisms, but it reminds me of that, that line where he essentially says, look, like you've got to treat the science TM in the same way you would treat it. If someone says, oh, this is Soviet science. Like you've got to understand that we are in an ideological regime and that colors everything, you know? So that's behind his, his, his analogy of the German cat. Right. And if anyone isn't familiar with it, essentially he, he talks about this in, in, and I don't know how true this exact anecdote is, but it, it serves a point. Right. Where he basically says, like, look, like imagine that you're a, you know, you're writing essentially like a niche interest magazine, you know, in 1932 in Germany about breeding cats. And then if you fast forward to 1944, that same magazine, well, it isn't talking just about, you know, breeding a Maine Coon with a perfect, with a perfect coat anymore. You know, it's talking about, you know, what does the, what, how do you breed a German cat? Like, what is the spirit of a German cat? Because essentially the purpose of that institution is no longer, you know, a bunch of nerds talking about breeding cats, right? It's ideological control and ideological, you know, essentially replication, you know? And so I think that you're definitely right about the, the capitalist angle to it, right? That there is, it is, it's a safe bet, you know, and especially in an industry where, $800 million, billion dollar budgets are kind of becoming the norm, right? Like people expect a return. And so they're not going to take a risk. I, I accept that. But there's something else to be said for the fact that like there are decisions being made that are purely ideologically motivated, right? Oh yeah, exactly. So so there's, there's like a twofold here, right? It's almost like, you know, who's leading whom? Because on the one hand, there are what we might call SJWs or the woke, who even going back to the Peter Jackson films were criticizing the Tolkien corpus for being, you know, reactionary, racist, sexist, you know, the whole the whole slew. They weren't yet that powerful or popular. So it kind of fell on deaf ears, especially as each of those movies won, you know, Academy Awards. But they've eventually taken over many of these institutions. And we've seen that with the Star Wars sequel trilogy. And so it, it what what I do see is a kind of hand in glove relationship where there's already this this market desire to cannibalize and, and cart off you know the carcass of the IP. And these are just the kinds of people that are willing to get their hands dirty doing it. 
Now they do it in their own unique way, but they're doing it. They're allowed to do it because the powers that be believe it's profitable. And, and that's fair. And I, I think the other thing that, and tell me if I'm reading into this too much, but it does seem to be that there's this kind of gleeful destruction of these properties. So I, I don't like anime at all, but I do like two anime. And one of them is, is Cowboy Bebop, right? It's not a particularly niche pick, but it's kind of a charming, you know, like serialized kind of like space noir, right? And it's it's obviously there's there's something there, but it's not it's not particularly complicated past a certain point, right? And I'll admit, I, I do enjoy bad movies and I really enjoy uh, subjecting other people to them. Maybe I'm a little bit sadistic. But I forced my poor roommate to watch all 10 episodes of the Netflix live action adaptation. And look, like Cowboy Bebop again, like it's not particularly sacrosanct, right? Like it's it's entertainment. But there is this almost like palpable joy in essentially ruining every character. So they essentially, and I'm not even joking, they made the main character this like particularly dislikable, like BDSM fetishist. And I'm like, why did you do this? Like, this isn't this isn't like an adaptation thing, you know. This is some type of, I guess, like joy in destruction, right? Like, you th there's some type of enjoyment to be had from essentially taking something well loved and making it particularly dislikable and gross. And I think that that's both true content wise, but I think you also kind of see it physically, right? Like, if you've ever if you've looked at a clothing advertisement in the last two years. It's very clear that there, there's some type of vested interest in showing off like horrifying land whales in clothing. And I'm going to be honest, I haven't been following the Amazon series particularly closely, but uh, in in the advertisements I've seen, the cast isn't exactly, uh, shall, shall we say, isn't exactly the top 1% as far as physical attractiveness goes. So do you see that kind of like joy and destruction that I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, there is this. The, yeah, the people that are doing the dirty work right now are definitely enjoying destroying it. So, you know, does the Amazon CEO get his jaws off by destroying the Tolkien IP? Probably not. It's just profitable to do so. So he's doing it. But the people that have been tasked with doing it, yeah, they enjoy it. And that's probably why they were hired for the job. Um, the other thing, too, is the, the big the big brewing, you know, controversy that's been developing that I touched on with um, Morgoth was that, you know, they're going to have, of course, non-white actors representing characters from Lord of the Rings and various other social, you know, uh, bugbears and whatnot. And the, the point, the point is this, right? No one would ever tolerate a movie of Shaka Zulu where he's played by a white guy. You know, right? Nobody's going to tolerate any of this kind of gender bending, or, or race swapping or gender swapping, unless it's done to historic European IPs or myths. And because it is a direct attack on those things, um, they're doing that on purpose, right? If they, if they were to say have like, I don't know, a, a drama about something in Meiji Japan, they'd have them all Japanese. They, they wouldn't offend the Japanese. And they certainly wouldn't offend the Chinese. If they did a Romance of the Three Kingdoms film, oh, you bet they'd all be good looking Chinese actors. Because they don't want to offend that base, so the the point is, yeah, they're they're. Do but you see, here's here's why they're able to do it, right? Because the audience is weak and divided, right? For like I said, they're not going to make a movie dissing Japanese characters or dissing Chinese characters because those markets are large and powerful, and will not, you know, buy the film. So, for example, to show you how powerful China is, for the Red Dawn reboot. It was supposed to be China that invades the United States, but in order not to offend the China market, they made it North Korea. So part of the problem is the sort of like what we might call heritage American or conservative or Christian or Tolkien fan base is very loosely organized. And that's partly one of the reasons why they feel free to offend it. Well, and, and I'll be perfectly honest. Like I, I, I'm not from kind of the wig nat sphere. I don't like, I don't necessarily like, view race as kind of an organizing principle in my life. And, you know, maybe I'm a little naive there, but there is something kind of, and I don't know, I, I say this as even someone who isn't 
like a Tolkien scholar. Like I don't have the knowledge base you do, but, but it's very clear in the work that, right. Like this is supposed to be kind of a, like a make believe Europe, you know, and in much the same way that it, you're right. It would be a little bit odd if, you know, Ryan Gosling was playing MLK, you know, you'd, you'd be taken aback by that. And in much the same way, I think I look at this and it's like, well, okay. Like when, when the hobbits have jerry curls, you kind of look at it and you're like, wait a minute, this, this isn't right. You know? And I, and I, again, like, and obviously this is far from the focus of the story, but there are, and again, I don't know how to phrase this delicately. Right. But there are very clearly characters of other extraction, right? Like the men of the East, you know, who are very clearly, and I don't know enough to say exactly what civilization they're based off of, but they're very clearly not like traditional white, you know, continental Europeans, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And of course the, the menace, the menace of the East in some sense is manifested with these evil men. Now, of course the orcs, which also uh, represent the menace of the East and also the North from Moria and the Misty Mountains. What's interesting here is that they're, they are twisted elves, right? So, so elves are the highest of all the free folk and the orcs are twisted representations of them. So, so maybe in a modern day terminology, we could view the woke as kind of like orcs. <laughs> they're coming out of a European, they're coming out of a yeah, European but twisted. background, yeah. but they've and been twisted. Is, I'm yeah. sorry. It, that's that's what I think is something like just deeply like insightful and true is that you know that quote going around about you know evil not being able to create it can only distort or destroy, and it reminds me a lot of of Lewis's I think it's in Mere Christianity where he essentially talks about his argument against dualism, you know the idea that good and evil are perfectly equivalent forces kind of battling it out, and he does say he's like look like dualism is as far as beliefs go, it's a fairly manly one, right? Like you accept that evil exists and you have to fight it. So that's positive. But what he says is essentially like you can't create anything purely evil, right? Like any evil impulse is kind of rooted in a good one, you know, like even the most sadistic, you know, like horrible mass murderer we can imagine, right? Like no one with very few exceptions wakes up every morning and they're like, well, I think I've decided to be evil today, you know? And even when we do see the kind of like Columbine mentality, it's rooted in this sense of kind of unfulfilled justice, you know? So there is kind of a deep truth to that idea that evil has no generative force, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, we, we see this again and again with the cannibalizing of IPs, uh, new, new concepts being few and far between Hollywood having all of its creative energies just, you know, used up going with what's safe, you know, circling around and around and also pitching to the lowest common denominator, you know, humor, violence, and sex, you know, don't, don't have anything sophisticated or thoughtful, just hit all three for the maximum, you know, shock effect. And yeah, it creates this sort of hollowed out effect. So like when you read about Frodo and Sam going through Mordor, they t Tolkien talks about like, the filth that's been vomited up from the earth due to, you know, Sauron's essentially use of volcanic activity for industrial production. Yeah, that's what we're seeing right now. It's just this filth being vomited up. Or 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 also when he talks about Angolian vomiting up blackness from her from her mouth, you know, to cons uh, to then shroud herself and consume everything else. It's this sort of like consuming spirit, this consuming ideal. And eventually, what we're going to see is like with Angolian herself, it ends up consuming itself. Right. And I think that you, I think that that's why there's this kind of like relentless pursuit of like new territory to conquer in a certain sense. Right. And so I, we all know this, right? Like people with our interests, right? Like everyone kind of has their own, you know, pet playground that got ruined, you know, and they're kind of mad about it. But there is this like churn that's kind of like there always needs to be new fuel, you know, and if the fuel goes away, I think you're very right that it is kind of self-consuming. And I think that we see this in the kind of like, and look, I'm, I, I, a lot of the physiognomy check stuff is, is a meme, right? Like I get it. It's a way to call people ugly in a way they don't understand, which is kind of funny. But also like there is something to be said for like, well, look at the kind of the foot soldiers of this movement. 
you know, they're not happy, well-adjusted people, you know, they're, they're miserable. And on one hand, that's kind of comforting. You're like, okay, well, the people who are trying to make my life hell, well, they're not exactly having a good time either. And that's kind of darkly, darkly gratifying. But I think there's also like a good deal of empathy to be had in that, in the sense that like, like you said earlier, like evil is real and has consequences and is corrupting, you know? And so like, while these people may kind of, and this again, not to keep going back to Lewis, but I think these men were very much in conversation with one another, both literary and, you know, face to face, obviously, but kind of this idea that, well, really everyone, everyone kind of gets what they want in the end, you know, but it's just often that kind of like, if you have a kind of go back to Augustine, like a misordered system of loves, right? You've kind of ordered your life around something inappropriately. It's like you said, it it eats you, you know, and it eats you in a different form, kind of, I guess, based off of your own personal, I guess, like bugbears, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of like how the, the, so I guess to tie this all up together in a bow, right? The, the evil that's assaulting Tolkien his work is assaulting his work in just the way one would expect from the description of evil that we find in Tolkien's work. Right. It's some kind of like supreme poetic irony, you know, in, in an odd way, Tolkien's whole work has kind of become the Shire. And if, if we can accept that kind of like clumsy analogy, right. And it's up against this like horrible, like mechanistic industrialized f force, Right. And I guess this is this is the 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 hope in Tolkien, right? Is that it is on one hand there is this kind of very Norse concept of of fate, you know, like the fate of men, but in the end, right? So the the good guys win, you know, as dumb as it is to say, right? Like there is kind of a hopefulness in it, even if it is bittersweet. Yeah. Now, what I think is important to add here is what makes I think Tolkien's work and how the good guys win really radically different than a lot of other of the, the myths and legends that he's using is it's only by resigning the use of absolute power do they win so at various moments frodo has to you know give attempts to give the ring to somebody he attempts to give it to gandalf he attempts to give it to galadriel they both refuse boromir seeks to take it by force um, Sam takes it because he believes Frodo was already dead and he has to complete the quest on his own, but then gives it back to Frodo once he realizes that Frodo is not dead. And so the idea is that the power, whether it's the power of rhetoric, Saruman's voice, the power of the machine, the sort of industrial system that Saruman and Sauron are producing, the, the power of terror, the power of you know, being able to charismatically lead people, right? So Sam has the the, the, the vision of Samwise the Strong once he uses the ring for himself. All of those are just shadows and are nothing. And as soon as, as soon as the, the Smeagol with the ring falls into the fires of Orodruin, we see that Sauron himself is reduced to a shadow because all of that was not, it's ultimately not real. And if you try to fight evil on those terms, then you become a new Dark Lord. That's, in fact, uh, in the introduction of the Silmarillion, I think that's where it's found. Christopher Tolkien mentions that his father said that, yeah, if you could take the ring and bend it to your will, you just become a new Dark Lord. So you're back where you started. And one of the reasons why I think we can look at the failure of the right in America is we didn't, we didn't learn that lesson. We're trying to fight, say, you know, the woke orcs on their own term. But it, at best, all you could do is become a new woke orc or, or, you know, a different version of that. So I think a good example would be the way the fascist reaction to communism. The Bolsheviks were clearly based on, you know, imposed state terror. And in order to combat it, the, the fascists of Europe took on very similar one party state apparatuses of the communists in order to fight them. So you, you end up becoming similar to the people you're fighting. And I think that that's one of the things that we're, we've also seen in, in, in the United States. Obviously, both parties are not totalitarian, but that we see the right stooping to some of the same behaviors of the left. And they don't work as well because they're not protected legally like the left is. And what I think we're beginning to see here is 
the scouring of the Shire, where the, the Shire or Tolkien's work is being polluted. But I think that the machine itself is nearing nearing its own cannibalization. And hopefully, you know, somebody has the equivalent of uh, Galadriel soil that they can scatter over the remnants of the uh, Tolkien estate and IP to bring it back afterwards. No, that's well said. So th this, we're kind of going out into the realm of, of speculation, but what do you think the next the next step is, I guess, for, for Tolkien's work? Do you think that, and this is something that has been kind of bouncing in my mind, do you think that it will kind of return to the state it previously existed in as kind of a niche thing, you know, and the, and the kind of the wider spread will be forgotten? Or do you think that it will kind of continue to be trotted out as some kind of like awful mashup? Well, yeah, that, that kind of, I guess, depends on how successful they are. So, for example, I'm not entirely sure what Disney's intention was when they tried to make Narnia into a series of films. They, they ultimately failed to complete the trilogy. Prince Caspian was wildly unpopular, which forced them to lose a lot of steam. And it's just sort of disappeared. Like, nobody really talks about Disney's Narnia anymore or any sort of Narnia film anymore. So, but again, what led to that, the original fan base, the, the Narnia fan base was generally positive to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but they lost a lot of people with the way they handled Prince Caspian. And while the Voyage of the Dawn Treader was, in my estimation, maybe the second best, the first best being the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they'd already lost so many of the fan base that it wasn't enough to salvage the IP. That could very well happen with Amazon's abortion. And I think that would be the best outcome. Because if there's no money to be made in it, it'll just go away. No, and, and that's, it's interesting that you say that because I think that, and I, I guess I'm always curious isn't the right word, but to see like how long essentially the, how long they'll keep their talons in it, you know, because there is this kind of like recurring pattern of essentially like assault victory and destruction right and obviously once it's destroyed like you said like the narnia movies and it's a different it's it's different right like i'm not saying there was kind of subversion in those you know it just wasn't as popular right from what i remember there wasn't anything like that but i always do wonder kind of like well what's left over afterwards you know like is it is it something that is just completely gone by the wayside in the sense that i and obviously i don't think tolkien will ever go that way right it's too big but i do am I guess I am just kind of darkly curious, you know, where this goes. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if they can make money cannibalizing it, they'll continue to do so. And that would lead to places I don't, I, I don't want to think about. I don't think anybody who's a fan of Tolkien wants to think about either. Another wild card is there's a lot of angry Tolkien fans out there now. And of all the IPs out there to trash, maybe after Star Wars, the Tolkien is is probably the most the most well organized, and I say that in a relative sense. So it depends on what kind of pushback you get from them, because obviously the pushback from the Narnia fan base took the winds out of Disney sales. And again, they weren't necessarily trying to subvert and destroy the IP; they were just kind of tone deaf in how they delivered it. So I, I think I think we can expect to see something like what happened to Disney's use of Narnia. It it flops, and it just sort of is dropped. No, I think that's probably a good analogy. I remember when those movies came out well, or came out well, I remember that time, but I didn't know, I guess, kind of the, the additional story on that. Although I will say completely odd biographical detail. I do know that Thomas 77 is it 777 is a huge fan of those Narnia movies. I don't know why that's the one biographical feature that sticks in my head. But it's interesting to me because I think that like what you said about the Tolkien fan base being kind of like relatively well organized is that it does kind of seem like the original kind of crop of Tolkien fans. And I realize it was to a certain extent generational was, it was kind of a very specific type of person, you know, in the, in the sense that it was like the, all the people I know who are very into Tolkien and are of kind of, let's just say like 35 plus, right. So old enough that the movies were definitely, you know, influential, but not, you know, massive events for them. They all kind of have a very specific, and it, it makes sense, right, with Tolkien's own personality. Like, it tends to attract a very, like, 
bookish and also I guess like kind of not fanatical in a negative sense, but very like dedicated fan base, you know? And so I think that a lot of the other properties that have kind of gotten ruined were definitely more, I guess, casual in a sense that like, look, like Lord of the Rings is not particularly easy to read in the grand scheme of things, right? Like it's not only long, but there's a lot of poetry in them. There's a lot of kind of, I guess, thing, or there's a lot of places to get stuck if you're not I guess like dedicated to it, and maybe that speaks more to just kind of like the, the average like de- like the degradation of the of the reading character, you know. But I do think that because there was such a high, a relatively high barrier to entry, to the series, right? That it did create, I guess, kind of a more dedicated, and more like well educated fan base. Am I reading that wrong? No, I think you're right, and I think it's also built in protection because something like Star Wars, which is a you know. LDC concept right out of the gate back in 19, was it 77? Um, you know, it's Lord of the Rings is a very highbrow thing. Now, there's a lot of people that like it, a lot of people that you might not expect to like it, like it, but it doesn't have that same accessibility. You know, it, it's more of um, what I what I think basically Amazon is doing. It's it's not actually trying to make money necessarily. Well. Some people think it'll make money, I guess, but there's a lot, there's a, there's from Moby Dick, uh, Ahab says that when he's, when he's arguing with his first mate over why he's hunting the white whale, he says that, you know, God wears a mask and the mask is the white whale and he wants to stab at the face behind the mask. And, and, and it's sort of an act of like, you know, um, petty vengeance. And I think that's sort of what these wokesters are motivated by, right? The people that are actually carting off the corpse and selling the pieces they're motivated by this Ahab monomania to stab the face behind the mask. And I think what they're going to realize is just like Ahab couldn't kill the white whale. You can't kill Tolkien. So it's interesting to me because left and right are difficult terms to define exactly. But I feel like one of the metrics we can use is essentially authority versus anarchy, right? Like, do you believe that authority is just, you know, the way things, should there be a hierarchy, right? Yes or no. It's not a perfect but it'll, it'll map on to those groups well enough. And, and to me, right, like having spent some time, as much as I'm embarrassed of it, in kind of more like right-wing anarchist libertarian circles, a, a lot of times there is this kind of just generalized hatred of authority. And on kind of an interpersonal level, it's it's oftentimes hatred of the father. Then it extends up to hatred of the state. And really what you're you're right it's stabbing stabbing the face behind the mask what i think it really is is kind of hatred of god as the ultimate authority and i think that f- for most people those those three things are kind of echoes of one another right like you you the way that you conceive of god and the way that you conceive of the father the state those are kind of linked you know they're not i'm not to say that we should have a patriarchal state or that you know i view my dad like god right I do think that there is kind of a a mirror image and I guess our relation to authority along those lines, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's what's motivating the sort of goons, you know, on on the street, so to speak. Whereas I think Amazon is motivated by, you know, and the way you make profit is you just sort of spitball and it's like, well, let's just have as many projects as possible. And some of them are going to make, some of them are going to make money. We don't know which ones necessarily, so we're just going to throw it all out there. So I think you have to look at it at the, the higher level and the lower level. And the lower level is definitely ideologically motivated to, to destroy the IP. And there has been a, an attempt uh, over the years of, of the woke to take over things like, you know, Magic the Gathering, the card game, fantasy in general, through our, through role-playing games and whatever, in order to take it over for themselves as a kind of hostile takeover, where they can... Su- they can sort of tell their own stories within the rubrics that they have inherited from other cultural mediums. It's kind of parasitic. It's kind of like the wasp that lays eggs in a caterpillar that kills it because they, they don't have a medium to tell their own stories. They have to hijack other mediums to do it. And in so doing, they destroy the medium. So it's also, we could also contextualize it this way. It's not necessarily motivated out of at an atavistic desire to destroy, though it might be. 
It could also be motivated by a lack of ability to have a structure to tell your own story in. So you want to tell a story, but you lack the means and the framework to do it, in part because the woke is just about uh, eliminating all distinctions and boundaries. So if you don't have any distinctions or boundaries, you can't tell a story. So what you do is you have this, you then have to hijack something that already has boundaries and then transgress all of them. And then you've destroyed it and you can't tell your story anymore. But in an odd way, you have you have kind of solved that problem of, and it's the issue that you face. Like if someone handed you a blank piece of paper and said, draw, right? Well, you're kind of up a creek. But, but I think that you've kind of almost created by having this property to kind of inhabit like a skin suit, you've created a negative identity, right? Like, well, my, my specific purpose, my identity, my story is about breaking this set of barriers, you know? And if you have that kind of like satanic in, not in the devil with horns, but satanic in the Milton sense view of the world of like rebellion, right? Like you have in a sense created a, a story by breaking something down. Right. And that's a comfortable, I guess that's a comfortable narrative to assume culturally, you know, it's, it's, there's, we have a lot of examples of that. So it's an easy place to imagine yourself. Well, exactly. Because this, the sense of deconstruction and rebellion is itself huh, reactionary because it's reacting to what's already there. And if there's nothing there for it to be framed by to then frame itself as an opposition to then it falls apart. It, it doesn't have, if it were to ever succeed, it would cannibalize itself because there'd be nothing left to subvert. There'd be, there'd be no medium for which their story to is to be told. Right. Which I guess is just another way of kind of restating that core point about being unable to create. So, I, and this is something I could, I could talk about for a long time, but you, you kind of mentioned before about, you know, fantasy in general being subverted. Do you have different what are your thoughts on fantasy as a genre right so in the modern times there's basically three authors that revitalized fantasy tolkien with the hobbit and the lord of the rings c.s lewis with the chronicles of narnia and ursula with earthsea now i've never read earthsea so i can't comment on that and what i think about it or not but i, I love narnia i love lord of the rings fantasy is i think intrinsically <clears throat> traditionalist because and and i think sci-fi tends to be more intrinsically progressive because because sci for sci-fi is always about you know using technology to overcome barriers to transgress barriers to to destroy barriers and transcend beyond whereas I will say, with with notable exceptions on sci on the sci-fi i agree with you more broadly but i would argue with and i i don't like sci-fi as a genre but i like a very few science fiction books i would make the argument that Frank Herbert does kind of buck that trend, but we can go back to what you said. I just wanted to make that known. Well, sure. And, and, and there are progressive woke fantasies now, but that's because they're trying to subvert the genre. Whereas trying to, trying to overcome boundaries, actually, these are two things that Lord of the Rings and Earthsea share in common. Cause I did see the Japanese anime of Earthsea from like the eighties, the idea of trying to transcend death, Right, so the men of Middle Earth seek to avoid death in the Silmarillion, and that gets him into trouble. And in Earthsea, I don't remember the guy's name, but there was a wizard who tried to transcend death, and it just led him killing a bunch of other people in order to finish the spell that wasn't going to work anyhow. And so the idea of constantly transgressing is bad, like, but that's a very right wing thing to do, right? You think about there's this sort of order in the world, and you're supposed to live within that order rather than to transcend and dominate it so technology and machines allow you to do that in theory magic could too and so the bad guys in fantasy tend to use magic and arcane knowledge to subvert and overcome the order of things but in so doing that makes them the bad guy and so by by the good guys are those that maintain and live within the order of things so in that regard i think that the good guys or sorry the fantasy tends to be more right wing or more, you know, um, rightist. No, that that's, that's well said. And I, I think that, I, I don't know. I think that you kind of see, cause look, I, it's no secret that like most, most fantasy is just pure schlock, right? Like it's just, it's, it's pulp. 
But uh, if you've ever looked at kind of modern fantasy, it, it has this hollowness to it. And it's because it's kind of taking on the form of a traditional society, right? Like in its most basic form, like, you know, swords and sorcery, right? But it is a progress or it is a traditionalist culture viewed through the language of essentially like 2010 California, right? And it creates this massive, at least in me, this, this massive, I guess, conflict between the way people talk and the way people interact. And it kind of goes back to what we were saying before we started about essentially technology allowing these type of ideas, you know, because ideas like egalitarianism, like a breakdown of gender roles are essentially enabled by technology. And so if you have a world with no technology, you have a world with none of the support structures for these kind of luxury beliefs, it's incredibly, it's incredibly, you know, out of place, right? Like it, it's, it's essentially the cultural equivalent of, of, you know, Lancelot, you know, showing up and saying, well, you know, where's my Uber Eats? You know, it just doesn't make sense, right? Like all of the things that would have to exist for that to be real are just gone, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, for okay, I, I will give the devil his due, right? George R. R. Martin does envision a fantasy world without contraception, and that leads to a lot of bastards. So I, I guess to give the devil his due, he does at least acknowledge that reality. But yes, in most fantasy today, uh, those kinds of male-female interactions uh are very reminiscent of today, but there's no abortion or contraceptive in the Middle Ages. So how are they doing this? Well, it's because they're just, they're putting it in the wrong setting. You know, it's, it's just not something you're going to have in a medieval ancient setting, which is what fantasy is usually set in. Um, and also, by extension, certain roles, right? One of my pet peeves is the fantasy trope of the female archer, because I guess people think, well, if she's a woman, she can't be on the front line, so she'll be an archer. Well, I mean, you know, if an English war bow from the Middle Ages has a draw strength of 75 to 150 pounds, there's no way a woman's going to be doing that. So even that isn't going to be something that you'd see in an ancient or medieval battlefield, unless maybe they used weak bows with poison arrows to compensate for their lack of a draw strength, but you're not going to see that. But again, it's just it's just completely out of place. Um, and even today, in you know professional athletic competitions, men and women are sex segregated. So e even that can't be. So so there's a, there's a higher order there's a higher order of delusion in fantasy. Or like you can create a D and D character, you have a female warrior fighting on the front lines. We don't even we don't even have that in professional sports. And yet, this higher level delusion is all over fantasy. And it's like no, this is. Again, to, to give credit where credit's due, the YouTube channel Shadowversity did touch on this topic and did, in a sort of roundabout, ham-fisted way, still basically say, yeah, women probably couldn't do this. I guess he didn't want to get like demonetized or canceled. But, yeah, it's ridiculous that there's no way that would happen in a fantasy world. Well, and it, it's frustrating, too, because it, there's this, I guess, like view of equality where to be equal with men, you must become a man, you know? And honestly, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin has, I can't remember the name of the book. I think it's called The Dungeon of Something. Or essentially her point is that she she wrote a truly feminine hero, right? And and over the course of this kind of short story in the Earthsea series, it, we kind of follow a, a priestess turned loose in a labyrinth, right? And her point was, look, I wanted to make a heroic character in fantasy but I didn't essentially want to make a man in a dress. You know, I wanted to make someone identifiably a woman, but still act heroically, you know, because obviously heroism is, is not, you know, sex segregated. And so it, it does create, and I think we see a lot of this in the like, you know, empowered woman in, in any type of fiction, right. Or it's just like this kind of like absurd caricature of like a hyper masculine man who is a 110 pound woman. You know, and it's things that would be absurd if a man did them, you know, like walking up, punching him in the face and be like, I don't take no for an answer. You know, like that's, that's an absurd thing to do regardless. But it's this like simultaneous like obsession with yourself in relation to men, right? While also 
like needing to individuate yourself. It's just such an odd mix. If you, if you see what I'm talking about. No. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there's so, so Tolkien in his, you know, fantasy Lewis in his fantasy is there, there's, there's no dysphoria or very little at least because the things people say and do and act are consistent with what one would expect given the, the, the technological norms, the, the social cultural norms of the time. And so it has a sense of, huh, well, in, in, in Lewis scholarship, Donegality, the sense that something just fits and it feels like you've been there even though you haven't been there. Uh, it has that sense to it. Whereas modern fantasy doesn't have a sense of Donegality because you're, you're putting 20th and 21st century ideas and concepts into the mouths of people that live in the Middle Ages. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. Which is why I think science fiction at least is a little more defensible if you're going to do that because it's the future. It hasn't happened yet. Um, but I would say, though, that the, the, the problem you're pointing out here with fantasy is it's dysphoria between the sort of like warp and woof in which the characters live and the characters themselves. Right, right. And it is this kind of – and I think you see this, right, where the – in much the same way that technology essentially like provides you the opportunity to believe certain things or language provides you the ability to express certain concepts. It is like that old Marshall McLuhan thing where to a certain extent, the media is the message, right? That there are just kind of ideas that flow from fantasy, right? And when you kind of try to break them, you can't do them and still have it be fantasy. It's kind of some kind of like odd distended chimera, you know, where it has the, the trappings of fantasy, fantasy as a setting, you know, but you can't quite, it, it becomes kind of hollow and fake, if that makes sense. No, exactly. Exactly. So in a sense, sci-fi doesn't have that problem because it's always placed into the future. And, and it's also based on the ever-increasing growth of technological uh, development and application. But with, yeah, with fantasy, that's definitely the case. I think in the post immediate post-Tolkien Lewis era of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, a lot of that was not necessarily intentional. I think it was just people that only knew their own experiences and really thought Tolkien and Lewis were cool and wanted to tell stories within that setting but we're, we're just clumsy and incompetent. Whereas I think now, though, a lot of this dysphoria is the result of intentional deconstruction. No, well, I think you're, I think you're right. And it is kind of this, this continual question of like, well, what's malice and what's stupidity, you know? And I think it's very easy to see both in, in this situation. And I don't know, I guess that I, at least, have kind of come to the same conclusions that a lot of people have that like, look like kind of looking to broader culture and expecting to see our ideas, you know, played back at us. I think that that's probably a, you know, vain hope at this point with notable exceptions, you know, like maybe one or two things spring through. And I think that is, I guess the comforting thing past a certain point is that like, they can't really ever take the Lord of the Rings away from you. You know, they can make something else that has the same words on it, but it won't be the same thing, you know? And it's always, I mean, the books are still there. You know, they're in every used bookstore in America, right? However many of them you want to take home. And so I think to me that like, and look, the movies are, I enjoyed the movies quite a bit, but I mean, no one would deny that they're an inferior version of the original, you know? And even like in many cases, I would argue that as much as you can get from his unpublished work, the Cimmerillion, like those aren't inferior in the sense that they're worse, but they are less, they're more specific tools, you know? And I think that the text itself is kind of why everything else exists, you know? And it's, at least in my mind, it's probably not wise to get too like stuck up in the details of, well, who owns the property now and is squeezing something out of it, you know? Because that that's kind of by virtue of the nature of being present, you know? It can't at least directly affect the original, right? Yeah, it, it can't directly affect the original. And again, having you know, if if we're talking to an audience that's read The Lord of the Rings, the fact that it exists at all, in this case as an IP, 
means that it has the potential to be corrupted. So the very fact that the Shire existed meant that there was a possibility that Sauron might try to corrupt it. Saruman might try to corrupt it. And uh, to an extent, Saruman did. But the point is, though, that's just that's just the price of existence. That's That shouldn't be a surprise, you know, so when someone says, oh, if only we kept control of the IP, this never would have happened. Well, over a long enough time frame, this is going to happen. Maybe not to maybe not at this time with these people. Could have been some later time with some other people. But regardless, the real question is how you know how do we how do we deal with that? Right. And I think the Lord of the Rings itself gives us the means to do it, right? So on the one hand, you have to wait for the evil to blow over. Uh on the other hand, you have to confront it when and where you can and you know preserve what you can. And then point at people to the truth rather than this ersatz, you know, garbage from Amazon. And I think that's that's well put. So I'm kind of running out of steam. It's getting a little bit late on the East Coast. So do you have anything to kind of wrap everything up in a bow? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think basically what what Middle Earth is is a sort of. Oh, I'll tie this back to Lewis. So at the end of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, when Lucy and Edmund realize they can never go back to Narnia. And Lucy says to Aslan, will I ever see you again? Aslan says, I have brought you to Narnia so that you can learn lessons that will teach you how to better know me in your world. I mean, it's Jesus. He's an allegory for Jesus. What, what Lord of the Rings does is, and, and good fantasy, so Lewis and Tolkien make a distinction from escape from reality to an escape into reality. So if we look at the clown world that is, you know, late stage capitalism, we can say, well, do we want more of that and go into the simulacrum? And, you know, just have, you know, Disney Star Wars. Or do you want to escape that into something more real that we currently don't have, like Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia? Well, the Lord of the Rings is the true myth that teaches us how to deal with the issues that the heroes in the books deal with, but in our own lives. No, that, that's well said. And it's it reminds me very much of kind of my big argument against, you know, the French, the French kind of absurdists. Like, I'll be perfectly honest. I despise Camus. I hate his, I just hate reading him. You know, again, maybe it's just that I'm uneducated. But there's this, this idea that you go into yourself to essentially go into yourself. Like, that's the point in and of itself. And it's like what you said, like, it's like what Lewis wrote, right? Like, you go into yourself to learn more about reality, right? To, to essentially make yourself in accordance with reality. And I think fantasy can be viewed in much the same way, right? That we fantasy is not an end in and of itself right it's good it's great but it it's there to essentially teach you lessons and not in a didactic sense right like i think that message fiction is pretty garbage but that said like there are there are kind of like what you said like perennial lessons in tolkien's work that i think will outlive this kind of you know like horrible you know like skin suit corruption of it so anyway, before we uh, before we wrap things up, praise of folly. Do you have any uh, any plugs you'd like to get out of the way? Yeah, sure. You can you can find me on YouTube. At, just type in the search bar, praise of folly podcast, and I should come up. You can find me on Twitter at pof podcast. You can find me at locals at praise of folly locals, where you can follow me for updates, support me, and engage with the channel there. All right, great. Well, everyone. Uh, you know where to find me. Obviously, I've, I've got my links down in the description. I've uh, I've just got an account over at Coffee. So if you you know think this podcast is worth anything, I'd really appreciate it. Obviously, I expect nothing, but it's always nice. And uh, anyway, guys, remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.